from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by Marshall University, with more than 100 degree programs offered in four locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. West Virginia University, a land-grant, space-grant, R1 research institution. Learn more at wvu.edu. Segra, providing fiber-based communication solutions. Segra, freedom to grow. More information at segra.com. Good evening. On this 52nd day of the 2021 legislative session, I'm Dave Mistich. We passed crossover day this week, the cutoff day for most bills to make it out of their house of origin. On the legislature today, an update on a major criminal code bill and two important health care bills. But first, a focus on pending proposals to eliminate the state's personal income tax, which in turn are driving the spending cuts in the House and Senate proposed budget plans. The lower chamber passed its version of the personal income tax repeal on Monday with House Bill 3300. On Tuesday, the Senate Finance Committee took up the measure and unveiled a strike and insert amendment. Tonight, we begin with a look at the proposal's evolution and what might be to come. With Wednesday's crossover day deadline looming, House Bill 3300 became, in a sense, a placeholder for the personal income tax reduction. Under that version of the plan, spearheaded by House Finance Chair Eric Householder of Berkeley County, the personal income tax would be reduced each year incrementally by $150 million until fully eliminated. The House Finance Committee's plan offers no mechanism to recoup revenue. Despite those lingering questions regarding revenue losses, Chairman Householder, while speaking to the measure Monday ahead of its passage, called the bill beneficial for all West Virginians. This is a new green deal for West Virginia, not the one that you're thinking of, but a true green deal that puts money in your pocket. Democrats, though, called the House's personal income tax reduction proposal rushed and lacking foresight. Here's House Minority Leader Doug Scaff of Kanawha County. We all want to reduce the personal income tax, but why do we have to do it today? On day 48, let's kick this thing in the summer, let's study it over interims, put a bipartisan work group together, let's do it right, let's do it responsible. Since then, the personal income tax reduction has moved at an accelerated pace, both from a legislative perspective and a philosophical one. Just one day after House Bill 3300's passage in the lower chamber, the Senate Finance Committee took up the measure and unveiled a strike and insert amendment. The Senate Finance Committee plan calls for an initial $1.09 billion in revenue losses that would be offset with $932 million a year in other tax hikes, including raising the state sales tax from 6% to 8.5%. The Senate plan would also reinstate the food tax at 2.5%. Additionally, it would bring in about $45 million each year by taxing recreational cannabis under the condition that the federal government decriminalizes or legalizes it. Senate Minority Leader Stephen Baldwin of Greenbrier County made note of the hypotheticals involved. When I was reading this bill, I was surprised that nearly the majority is about cannabis. <laughs> and Senator William Elenfeld, a Democrat from Ohio County, spoke up to take issue with an increase to the hotel tax. If we were to adopt this bill, we would have the at 18 or 19 percent, the, the highest sales tax rate for hotel rooms in the country. Senate Finance Chair Eric Tara of Putnam um, County says it will all even out and give West Virginia an opportunity Virginia for growth. Is. We are in a critical time right now that uh, of opportunity, especially having seen the state's finances here over the past couple years with heading into um, a potential $300 million surplus this year when we're used to having on average about $50 million of surplus. Um, we are st starting to see income grow um, for people that are coming here. We see people who are wanting to move to places like West Virginia from across this country. Even as the House and Senate have moved forward with their own ideas, Governor Justice continues to tout his own vision for a reduction to the personal income tax. In my plan, you have to go big. In my plan, if you don't go big, nobody's going to believe it. Nobody's going to move to West Virginia on a whim. They have to believe. They have to believe it's going to happen. So in other words, you have to go significantly significant. 
The Senate's version of House Bill 3300 is expected to be up for passage in the upper chamber early next week. If it passes, the measure would head back to the House for consideration. But the question as to whether the two chambers can find some middle ground to get the proposal completed by day 60 at midnight remains. And if so, Governor Justice would have to get behind that final product as well. To further discuss these pending fiscal policy changes and several joint resolutions that remain now that crossover day has passed, I spoke yesterday with longtime State House reporters Phil Kabler of the Charleston Gazette Mail and Stephen Allen Adams of Ogden Newspapers. Thank you both for being here. I want to start with the personal income tax reduction. Of course, we've seen three proposals so far, one from the governor, one from the House, and now one from the Senate. Uh, of course, the House passed their version, House Bill 3300, on Monday, but now the Senate is looking to do something yet again very different. Phil, do you want to talk about the current version of the PIT reduction moving through the Senate? Sure. Uh, I think, I, as I wrote, I said it's the uh, House plan on steroids that the House had a, not, not a conservative plan, but it would uh, do multiples of $150 a year, a million a year to phase out the income tax, where the Senate came in, swooped in, and made the first year cut. $1.09 billion, so it's even bigger than what Justice was proposing, and it has, in both the Justice plan and the Senate plan, have roughly about $900 million in new taxes, predominantly through uh, uh, raising sales taxes, but the Senate plan, again, Justice would have had a 7-point 9% sales tax up from 6% and the Senate on steroids says we can do you one better we'll make it 8.5% so at this point as you say you've got these three plans that are really have no uh, common ground so how it, it's as I was saying if you had one section you said well we've got 50 million here and you've got 70 million so let's call it 60 but these are so far apart i don't see how they r rectify them here in the last few days maybe they'll pull something off but it just seems like we're we're almost looking at different animals as opposed to the the basic concept of rolling back income taxes right and, and what sort of response from the public are we hearing about these proposals uh, generally, I, I think uh, there's a, a lot of criticism, particularly the uh, uh, Senate plan and the governor's plan over the the uh, high tax increases that would be used to offset not the entire income tax cut, but a, a good portion of it. So I think there's a lot of criticism there, p p particularly among groups that represent uh, senior citizens and lower income households who, as we know, regressive taxes tend to hit those groups uh, the hardest, where a, a progressive tax like an income tax uh, adjusts as you have more and more wealth. So in, in the, uh, I'm not sure there's been a huge uproar, although I guess there's going to be a protest here at the Capitol tomorrow or, or on Friday, but uh, uh, I think there. I'm not sure people are familiar enough with the whole concept yet to really get in an uproar about it. But from what reaction there's been has been largely negative until you get up to uh, some of the uh, uh, business, business people like uh, Governor Justice brought together for his town hall who would uh, be most likely to benefit from the income tax cuts as a opposed to uh, these other tax hikes. Right, right. Steve, I want to turn to you. Uh, part of the Senate's proposal calls for revenue to be made up from recreational cannabis. That comes with a caveat, of course, if it is ever legalized by the federal government. Um, but an amendment to the personal income tax reduction bill in the House would have had cannabis revenues act as a trigger in some way for income tax reduction. I know this isn't exactly the same thing, but there's sort of a fundamental underpinning here. I'm curious, is, is cannabis going to be a sticking point at all when it comes to the personal income tax reduction? Well, it just depends. Uh, it's real interesting, the fact that the Senate included uh, about, if you happen to see the PowerPoint presentation that they put together, it was 30 pages, the uh, uh, part dealing with uh, 
recreational cannabis possible legalization uh, was about nine pages long and made up a big bulk of the plan. And obviously they're trying to prepare and in many ways kind of hand off the situation to the federal government. Obviously somebody thinks that uh, at some point a Biden administration may possibly uh, try to legalize uh, or decriminalize this in, in some way. And we are seeing more movement towards this. New York State just uh, legalized recreational marijuana. Uh, and everybody says that if we would just do it, it'd certainly bring in a lot of revenue and there's a lot of evidence for that as well. Uh, the plan that the Senate has put together obviously is set up uh, uh, and in many ways, it's great. It takes a regulatory framework and tries to prepare for what might happen. Uh, but the problem they're going to run into pretty quickly with that is, depending on what the feds do, we may have to come in and change that depending on what they allow. For example, how many grams they may allow to, to be sold and taxed and things of that nature. So yeah. it's definitely going to involve the legislature coming back in to deal with that in some way. But we're also seeing a little bit of, I would call maybe easing of concerns with uh, recreational cannabis for sure. I know Mike Pushkin had an amendment to a criminal justice reform bill uh, that came within four votes uh, of actually decriminalizing small amounts of recre uh, recreational cannabis for personal use. So we might be possibly seeing something, maybe not this session, obviously, but maybe in the next session where we might actually go forward and try to legalize recreational cannabis ourselves. Right, right. And pulling back on this personal income tax, of course, you know, through all of this, and, and as Phil t pointed out, you know, th there's these three different plans are all very different. The governor has been touting his own plan to reduce the personal income tax. I, I guess the question I have for, for either of you, you guys can take your pick who wants to go first. Could we anticipate any sort of compromise on this issue ahead of day 60 at midnight? Or, or is this shaping up to be a call on a call for a special session? Well, personally, uh, uh, from the governor's reactions, and I think he uh, uh, gave some interviews uh, on the uh, um, Thursday reacting to uh, the the Senate proposal and wasn't very conciliatory toward what the Senate has done and acted like he was put out because he hasn't been included in the negotiations, which of course is a bad sign if you have uh, parties who aren't talking to each other or not talking to each other uh, sufficiently often. That's, a, that's another uh, formula for, for real disaster. So the fact that you're not having open lines of communication is another thing that makes me wonder if, if uh, certainly wonder if this is possible to get done in the regular session, uh, let alone whether there's a possibility of cooler heads coming back in a special session. And I talked to the governor last night just real, real quickly uh, for, for a story I had in the paper this morning. My sense from him is he would certainly like to bring everybody to the table. Obviously, business groups have come out against his plan, but have come out in favor of the House version. We don't know where they stand on the Senate version right now. Uh, I imagine they're going to be against it because it has some of the same issues. But the governor is open to bringing all these people together and is even open to a special session. But I think he thinks if it doesn't happen with between now uh, and the end of session next Saturday, uh, it's not going to happen at all, and the window of opportunity is going to close. Right. Moving on a little bit here, uh, gentlemen. Uh, Phil, I know you've been following along with some legislation dealing with gun rights and the Second Amendment. There was, you know, Senate Joint Resolution 1, which passed the upper chamber this week uh, with its needed two-thirds majority. Tell us a little bit about that proposed constitutional amendment and its journey so far. Yeah, and it seems like there's a, a heightened uh, uh, sense of need to pass these amendments and bills with the Congress being in, in democratic control and a democratic uh, president in the White House. In fact, as uh, Brandon Steele said in the committee the other day, said you can either uh, be with the uh, Second Amendment folks in West Virginia, or you can be with what he called the bootlickers in Congress. So the uh, resolution, and it was uh, toned down considerably uh, from its original language, but it would basically put into the Constitution something we've had in state law now since 2014 that prohibits cities and counties from enacting any gun safety ordinances that are 
stricter than state law. Now, it, it originally had language in, in the bill that, that uh, Delegate Steele has sponsored uh, that's now in the uh, Senate Judiciary that would basically prohibit uh, state, county, uh, municipal law enforcement officers from enforcing any gun safety, federal gun safety laws that are stricter than state law. So there's some question whether that's even constitutional. And as uh, several law enforcement officers testified, they could put uh, their federal funding and also their ability to work with federal authorities like the uh, uh, ATF in in doubt. So there's a, uh, and of course uh, this this legislature is, is the legislature has long been gun friendly. But uh, there's some question about whether that proposal, if it makes it through, would would be uh, constitutional. Right, uh, Steve. I want to I want to jump ahead here and and talk about you know some other proposed constitutional amendments. Uh, namely, as it relates to property taxes. Uh, these are joint resolutions, of course, require two thirds majority in each chamber. And if adopted both by both the House and Senate would land on the ballot uh, for ratification by the general public. You know, there was Senate Joint Resolution 7, uh, which was sent to the Rules Committee. It didn't make it over the, the crossover day deadline, but House Joint Resolution 3 did make it. Uh, could you tell us really quickly about that proposal, if you would? Yeah, uh, House Joint Resolution 3 passed 84 to 16, so it passed uh, with well more than the uh, two-thirds or 67 members needed uh, to support it. So now it's heading over to the state Senate. Uh, what it basically does is it will allow the West Virginia legislature, once it's approved by the voters, to begin to either cut or phase out or make changes to uh, property taxes in regards to uh, business and uh, inventory, uh, heavy machinery, equipment, uh, things of that nature. Now that tax brings in about $400 million, according to uh, Eric Householder, the chairman of the House Finance Committee. It appears to be the vehicle, as you said, uh, uh, SJR 7 uh, was moved to rules and is effectively dead. So it looks like uh, HJR 3 is going to be the avenue used to try to push this. It's long been an agenda item of Republicans and the business community in the state. All right, gentlemen. Well, that does it for us today. I want to thank you both for the time and uh, appreciate all the work you guys are doing over there at the Capitol. Thanks. Thanks. The House of Delegates passed its budget bill this afternoon, which includes its personal income tax repeal plan. House Bill 3300 will be on the amendment stage Monday on the Senate floor. Also Monday, the governor is planning to convene a personal income tax summit to work out the differences amongst his plan and the House and Senate versions. Earlier this week, the House passed a bill that would extend Medicaid coverage for women who just had a baby. June Leffler has this update and more. House Bill 2266 would extend Medicaid coverage for women one year after giving birth. Current law covers women for 60 days after delivery. Republican Delegate Matthew Rohrbach of Cabell County, Vice Chair of the House Health and Human Resources Committee, is the lead sponsor of the bill. He points to research that women are most often vulnerable to mental and physical health conditions several months after giving birth. What we know from our statistics from our uh, mortality, uh, our maternal mortality review committee that this state set up a few years ago that the period from seven to 12 months postpartum is the deadliest period for these women because they lose access to their care. A 2013 report from the state says of all maternal deaths from 2007 to 2012 in West Virginia, most occurred more than 60 days after delivery. The bill would apply to women who make 185% of the federal poverty guideline. That would include single moms making less than $33,000 a year. If passed, the coverage expansion would cost the state $1.4 million each year, according to a fiscal note. Matching federal funds would also help pay for costs. The measure was approved 98-2 to two and now heads to the Senate. On the other side of the Capitol, senators this week voted to expand the use of medical marijuana. Senate Bill 231 adds dozens of more health conditions that could be treated with cannabis, including Alzheimer's, glaucoma, migraines, and any form of chronic pain. The bill permits patients to consume cannabis in edible form or smoke it.
Currently, patients may only use pills, oils, and topical treatments. Senators voted in favor of the bill 29 to 5. Both of these measures passed their respective chambers with bipartisan support. Just in time for Crossover Day. Another bill that made it through on Crossover Day was the 400-page House Bill 2017, which would change the way judges sentence people for hundreds of crimes, from computer hacking to larceny and robbery to homicide. Emily Allen joins us now to break down that bill. Welcome, Emily. Uh, we'll start with this new classification sentencing for people to jail and prison uh, and for giving fines. What, what exactly does this change? Yeah, so uh, right now in uh, a criminal code, most crimes come with a, a set range that judges have to impose. We call that indeterminate sentences. So it includes kind of the minimum amount of time that someone would have to serve before they're parole eligible and then the maximum amount of time they would serve. So this bill, um, at, at the core of it, it crosses out all these um, indeterminate sentences and replaces it with a six felony, three misdemeanor system. And all the, the, the crimes, depending on their severity, r relate with these or correlate with these classifications. And each classification comes with its own range that a, a judge can pick from. So class one felony being the worst, uh, class three misdemeanor being the, the, the least restrictive. Right. And, and so when this bill, bill passed out of committee, it took more than five hours of discussion. Tell us a little bit about some of the objections that we saw. Sure. Um, so it was in the, the House Judiciary Committee. There wasn't a lot of testimony, uh, but we did hear from the West Virginia Prosecuting Attorneys Association. They said that they, you know, as a group, had not been consulted. There are a few other stakeholders in the criminal justice world that uh, say they weren't involved. Um, and and their, the, the Prosecuting Attorneys Association, their biggest um, Concern was a, a vehicle that judges get through this bill to um, downsize somebody facing charges on a, a class six felony to a class uh, one misdemeanor. So that, that would mean less jail time and obviously a misdemeanor looks better on your record, right? Um, they just said that that would uh, you know, hinder a victim's abil or ability to easily predict stuff in, in the process and that could be uh, pretty uncomfortable for them. Right, right. So and this bill would also allow judges to drop certain felony charges to a misdemeanor, as you just said. Uh, if they deem fit, why would that be a part of the bill? Sure. So um, this is a bill that, you, you know, we didn't get to speak to the lead sponsor on this legislation, but in remarks to the House and in a Q&A they hosted, he, he said that focusing on jail overcrowding was something that uh, was present throughout this whole process. They got to work on this bill, I think, around April 2020. Um, and I mean, it's worth noting that even right now this week, we have nearly 6,000 people sitting in regional jails um, and against a capacity of 4,265. So that was sort of a way that judges would get the discretion to downsize their jail populations. However, the Prosecuting Attorneys Association pointed out that um, some of these classics felonies that judges would have the ability to downsize if they wished, um, it include, you know, abuse-related charges, uh, child porn related charges. So um, that, that's just something that they're going to have to buy with. Okay. The biggest question that's come up on the House floor and, and in committee is how this bill would affect the work of a sentencing commission um, that the legislature created last year. Very important, you know, panel there. How exactly does this work? Sure. Um, so that's this kind of uh, was one of the, the debated points because that's a point of confusion. The bill's lead sponsor, Delegate Brandon Steele, a Republican from Raleigh County, says this bill does not undercut their work. Um, there are still chapters of state code dealing with, uh, you know, the criminal procedure and obviously the Uniform Controlled, Drugs, uh, Controlled Substances Act um, that this bill doesn't touch. So, uh, you know, it's pretty much the same that the commission could still consider. Um, but a, a lot of people in the House that voted on this bill and looked at it wanted, uh, you know, the 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 House to wait before passing an effort like this. Nobody fully agree, like disagreed or agreed with the bill. They just uh, disagreed with not waiting. So the Sentencing Commission, it's a 13-member group uh, involving you know law enforcement officials, public defenders, prosecutors, um, uh, you know representatives for the Division of Corrections and Rehabilitation through the Department of Homeland Security. All these guys, uh, they're supposed to meet, I think, for the second time this year, April 9th, and they're supposed to have a, a report that would inform the legislature on sentencing recommendations next January. Um, so we'll see what happens if this bill passes and, and how that changes their work. Right. And, and, you know, we've got just a few days left in the session. Do, do, do we see this bill gaining traction? It's obviously going to go to committee over the Senate. You know, what, what, what do we expect to happen to it over there? Sure. Uh, well, I, I think it's been referred to the Senate Judiciary Committee. It passed pretty much along party lines in the House. So, you know, say it spares some Republicans. I, I think uh, one delegate on the Democratic side had voted in its favor. Um, so we'll see what that means.
Great. Well, Emily Allen with a recap of House Bill 2017, uh, a rewrite of the criminal code. Emily, thanks so much for the update. Thank you. And as we close this evening, a reminder to listen to West Virginia Morning for daily legislative updates and go to our website for the latest news at wvpublic.org. We stream the floor sessions daily on the West Virginia channel, and we'll be back next week for a final Friday night wrap up of the session on the legislature today. I'm Dave Mistich. For everyone here at West Virginia Public Broadcasting, thanks for joining us and have a safe weekend. Support for the legislature today is provided by Marshall University, with more than 100 degree programs offered in four locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. West Virginia University, a land-grant, space-grant, R1 research institution. Learn more at wvu.edu. Segra, providing fiber-based communication solutions. Segra. Freedom to grow.